prophet Isaiah writes, we who walk in darkness see a great light. On those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, a light is dawning. Of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. Take heed, watch, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. The light is dawning and salvation is at hand. May the Lord be our light and our life. Please stand and join with me in our call to worship. But about that day and hour, no one knows. For as in the days of Noah, when they knew nothing of what was to come, we shall therefore keep awake. Therefore, we also must be ready. seated.
If we claim to be sinless, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sins before Almighty God. Loving God, look upon your service with mercy. We confess that we have not expected your coming kingdom. We have easily given in when confronted by temptation and have presumed to be more righteous than we really are. We have not sought your justice, nor have we welcomed your mercy. Forgive us, we pray, and consecrate us anew for your service, that we may confidently see your promises fulfilled. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This is a true statement, to be universally accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My Christian friends, we can believe this. It is the good news of the gospel. In the person of Jesus Christ, we stand justified, we stand sanctified. And our sins are forgiven. Jesus' birth is so good that we should be excited and we should be 
As God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by the proclamation of his word. Let us pray. Again, gracious God, we know of our own merits. We cannot come before your throne. We cannot come before your spirit in hopes of asking or pleading or beseeching anything of you. Yet by the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, we dare to approach you, to illumine our hearts and minds, to give to us the same heart and mind that was in Christ Jesus, that we too might be able to go forth into the world empowered by the words that you speak to us this day, words which well up within us to be grace, words that well up in us to be a sign of salvation and life. May we be so empowered that we can be the embodied presence of your Son, for all whom we encounter, may all know your love and grace, your justice and mercy through our actions. May they know it by the indwelling of your Son, your incarnate word living in us. Speak to us this word this day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the letter of Paul's to the church at Rome. Chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. To set the stage for you, uh, a bit of what's going on in Paul's letter, um, this letter is perhaps, uh, is regarded by, I think, most biblical scholars as Paul's best letter. Of course, I guess that's a, um, a judgment call, depending on what, uh, what you're looking for and what Paul writes. But uh, it is the most theologically packed of all of his letters. And he's writing to a church that he's never visited. It's rather odd among all of Paul's writings. Uh, all of his letters are written to people or churches that he knows that he's been to. He's never been to Rome. He has never been to this church. Paul writes this letter because Paul believes that uh, he's uh, pretty much well accomplished most of all that he can do in the eastern half of the Roman Empire in his missionary journeys. He now wants to carry his missionary journeys westward to uh, Iberia, which is modern-day Spain. Uh, he wants to carry it in that direction, but he needs a base of operations. And he's hoping that the church in Rome will sponsor him as he is about to set out to carry the gospel which he has been preaching in the east to the west. What we see in this particular stretch of, uh, of Paul's writing in Romans is uh, building on the theme that he starts in chapter 12, where he talks about uh, calling us not to be conformed uh, by this age, uh, not to be conformed by this world and its values, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, the renewing of our spirits, the renewing of our very selves in Jesus Christ in the anticipation of his coming. In fairness, Paul believes uh, that Jesus is coming back at any moment. Paul believes he is the last generation of human beings that will be living on the planet. That's obvious in his writings. Uh, we know that that part of Paul's letters, he's uh, probably missed a... Uh, certainly we know at least by 2,000 years, uh, but, uh, but the point is still true. Paul is speaking to a congregation, letting them know that their hope of salvation, their hope of new life, their hope of being the presence of the kingdom of God in this world, all rests on the fact that they can anticipate its fulfillment in the coming of Jesus Christ, which holds tr it held true then, it still holds true for us today. Here we're going to see Paul speaking to us about the coming of Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and our forward-looking, our future gaze at the coming of Christ. Listen for the word of God. <coughs> Besides this, you know what time it is. How it is now the moment for you to wake from your sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when, when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. <coughs> Let us live honorably as in the day not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. <coughs> Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. You know, it's true today, my Christian, peer, uh, my Christian friends here in the 21st, uh, tw yeah, this is the 21st century. 20, in the 21st century, uh, we are no longer dominated, I think, by uh, our understanding in the Christian faith of a, a sense of the nearness of Christ, such as was uh, to the extent that Paul was. Uh, as I said in my introduction, uh, the Apostle Paul, like, like most Christians of his era, first century Christians, Paul believed that Jesus was coming back at any moment because he, he believed in the resurrection. And he believed that, Je that, he believed that when I say the resurrection, I don't mean just the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul believed in the resurrection of all of God's people, that that was a future event. And because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had been raised from the dead, he takes that as a sign that they are now living in the final age when the dead shall be raised, when we will all be raised from the dead. <coughs> he believes this. You see this in his writings. He's constantly referring to Jesus as the first fruits of resurrection. He believes that Jesus is that sign that uh, we are living in an age when the kingdom of God will finally be realized. Christ will return and bring to fulfillment all that the kingdom of God represents all of its love and compassion, all of its hope, all of its grace and justice, all of its mercy. This is what Paul believes. <coughs> I dare say, my Christian friends, I believe it too. I don't believe it's happening, it will necessarily happening, it will be happening as imminently as Paul believed, but I believe it happens. I believe in that hope because I believe in the kingdom of God. I believe in the future of Jesus Christ because I believe what God says about the virtues of the kingdom of God, that love is better than apathy, that compassion is better than, <coughs> than just getting along, that sacrifice is the true way of making Christ's love known. I believe this. It's not, yes, uh, Jesus Christ proclaims it, Scripture witnesses to it, and common sense within me tells me that's the way it's got to be. It's not a hard belief for me. I hope it's not a hard belief for you. We live in a world sometimes where uh, we think that uh, perhaps things are so terrible that, that they can't possibly be good again. Paul believes otherwise, and the Christian message proclaims otherwise. It's precisely this future, God's future, that casts its light into our present and that proclaims that uh, the illumination of a new reality is upon us, a, a reality that we're called to live by. Is, is what we're living in right now the kingdom of God? I doubt it. But it is reflected in us. We get glimpses of it through what we, we know of Jesus Christ. We get glimpses of it by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We get glimpses of it in the lives of God's people as they live Christ's compassion. The conviction that Christ will return is the conviction that God will, in fact, one day redeem creation to its fullest. That God will one day fulfill the promise of restoration and recreation Side note, recreation, recreation, I think it means the same thing. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, rec maybe it depends on context. Recreation, recreation, it is God's promise of a new reality. Given in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ is that promise. His resurrection is witness to a new reality. Indeed, it is precisely the fact that the future has already invaded the present for us, that makes it possible for us to live by faith. This is, uh, in, in John's gospel, Jesus makes that statement, I won't leave you orphaned when I leave you. He gives to us the Spirit. God's Spirit lives in us, abides in us. The community is defined by it as a, as a, a guardian holding us over, 
until Christ returns. This is part of what we believe. It's what makes the kingdom of God visible and present in the loving acts that we do. To lose sight of the return of Christ with its promise of God's restoration and recreation is, uh, is further to run the risk of thinking that if any good is going to happen in this world, if any restoration or recreation is going to happen in this world, uh, we are the ones who have to produce it. That is, that is a myth, my Christian friends, and it occurs when we lose hope in the fact that Christ will return someday. That the kingdom of God will, will manifest itself in its fullest. When we allow ourselves to believe that there is not a future promise that God will keep, then we're left here on our own. We are truly orphaned, and we get to, into thinking that if, if the good news we've been proclaiming is going to come to reality, we're going to have to do it. This is the very thing that Paul preaches against in this letter. It's in this letter that you get that, that statement, of, that famous statement of, that uh, Martin Luther latched on to of justification by faith. The idea that, that you can't make the world right, you can't make yourself right of your own merits. It has to be done by God himself. Because if you try to do it, Paul calls it self-righteousness. We're trying to save the world when in fact we're the ones who are broken. We are the ones who are the problem, we human beings. I'm not saying you're an evil person, my Christian friends, but we have lived in an age of darkness because no matter how good we are, we still don't love our neighbors as ourselves. We don't love as fully as we ought. There's always, even in the best of us, there is that slight taint of sin that little bit of brokenness in our relationship with God, with each other, and with ourselves that, that carries over into every good action that we do. There's always a hint of brokenness, even in the best of us, even in the best that we do. There's always going to be, we can always reflect the kingdom of God, but without Christ, that kingdom means nothing. We Christians sometimes lull ourselves into believing that uh, Jesus came, he taught us what to do, and now we're on our own. We are not on our own. We are not abandoned. We are not hopeless. We have Christ to look forward to, and in the meantime, we have the abiding Spirit guiding us, calling us, leading us. To think that it all falls on us is to fall back into the problem that Paul himself finds his reason for having to write this letter. The self-righteousness of those who believe that unless they do the good, it can never be done, is a fearful thing. I'm afraid it may be aboard our churches these days. People have begun to lose hope, to lose hope. Christ has not returned, and they begin to wonder. Every time you hear these, these predictions, these, um, these pontifications of people saying that Christ will come back on this day or this day and this day, it doesn't happen. People begin to lose hope. I'm here to tell you we can't lose hope. There is always, we're always forward-looking because that future defines our present. It shines into our present. It makes us who we are. I look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, and that's why I am awake today. That's why I don't slumber. That's why I don't put myself aside thinking, well, Jesus Christ really isn't going to come. The kingdom of God really isn't going to be realized. Therefore, I can just coast. Because in the end, it doesn't really matter. I mean, think about it. The kingdom of God no longer matters if we don't see it in the future. It, 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 it is the fact that it is a future event that, it, that defines how we see the kingdom of God today. Christians, therefore, are creatures of the future, not the past, according to Paul. To the future, we are to look, and by it, we are to act. We, are, we know the kingdom of God reaches its fulfillment 
in Jesus Christ, that does not mean we can just step aside and assume that we don't have any responsibilities today. We must reflect that kingdom, as imperfect as that reflection is, as dim and as marred as that reflection is. That's what defines our faith today. We see this with the call to, to live in transformity to the will of God's future, not the conformity to today and today's values. <coughs> It, that's why I say this Paul is continuing the theme that he started back in chapter 12. Don't be conformed to today. Be transformed today by looking at tomorrow's promise. That's the renewing of your mind. That is That in its turn means that we are not to live for ourselves. Today, we are to live for God's tomorrow. We live for God. In fact, that's, that's part of what he means in this very strange phrase that uh, uh, it's an interesting metaphor. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ like a cloak. Wear Jesus Christ. What does Paul mean by that? He means take on the love of Christ. Be the love of Christ. Wear the compassion of Christ. Be the sacrifice of Christ. Be Christ for the world. That's the renewing of our minds. That is looking to the future, knowing that there is a promise of fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Put that on today. <coughs> in your own way, be Christ for the day. Be loving, be compassionate. Be sacrificial. Continuing in chapter 12, Paul did, does talk about the fact that uh, when we have the renewing of our minds, we become a living sacrifice. We put on Jesus Christ. And at the sacrifice, you've heard me say it many times, I'll say it again. There's no love without compassion, no compassion without sacrifice. To love others is sacrifice. To be the kingdom of God for others is sacrifice. We live that. We can live that today because of the promise of the future. We are to shape our present in the light of God's future. This is what the Christian faith and the Christian life are all about. And I think a wonderful way for us to begin the season of Advent. The season of hope. The hope of a fulfilled, of a fulfilled promise in the future. We are liberated <coughs> from the burdens of our sinful past. Doesn't mean they <coughs> doesn't mean they don't, they didn't exist, and it doesn't mean that you don't uh, uh, have the ability within you to sin. You still do. That's not what that means. But you're you're freed from its bondage. You're freed, uh, as Paul would say. You're not you're not enslaved to it. You're not defined by it. You are you are not seen by God as a sinner. He looks to you, as Paul says, and reckons you as righteous. Not because you are righteous, but because God is righteous and he loves you. He loves you in Jesus Christ. When he looks at you, he does not see the past sinner. He sees Jesus Christ. That's what God sees. That future promise is what God sees in us now. And liberated from the burden of our past sins, we Christians now stride with confident steps into a future, which brings us even closer to the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan for this world. Be awake, my Christian friends. Don't slumber. Don't fall back into thinking that Christ's coming doesn't matter. Let it define who you are today. Let it transform you in the renewing of your minds, your hearts, your souls. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.
heard in the proclamation of the word a call to faith, may we now reaffirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Let us reaffirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. say that we have uh, we have not one but two moments for mission today uh, one <coughs> from the missions committee associated with uh, the giving tree and the second one a little in a moment uh, uh, from uh, the admin committee about stewardship uh, so uh, Bonnie uh, perhaps we can hear some word about the giving tree favorites uh, of all the things that we do at the church during the year and this one comes during Advent and it's called the Giving Tree. I hope some of you read the long detailed message I put in the newsletter about this and we've done this before and so you're probably quite aware of how this works but this morning you're going to find two trees, one is in the narthex and one is downstairs in the corner by the doors where you can go out from the fellowship hall. And I was delighted to hear that you're all going to go down there to drink cocoa. So you'll be right there uh, ready to take these star ornaments from the tree. And the way it works is Every ribbon has two ornaments, two star ornaments. They're identical. And what you do is you find one or two or maybe three on the tree that you think fits your budget and your, um, shall we say, knowledge of what the items are. Sometimes the teenagers ask for things that I've never heard of before, I noticed, so I have to do some research on that. By the way, for the young people, I think there are uh, ornaments representing items that might fit your interests in your budget. Uh, not everything on an ornament is really, really expensive. In fact, I've tried to make it so that most are not expensive. Uh, I don't know what your notion of expensive is, but that uh, is up to you to decide. So you pull one of these off and the one with the ribbon is best to take with you because then you can use it as the identifier for your package that you're going to bring back. Tape it on, use the ribbon, whatever, so we know what's in it. The other one, you write your name on the back and there's a box by each tree to just place it in. That way we can keep track of who's taking what ornament. If you have any questions or you need someone to shop or wrap or uh, whatever, I'll be glad to do it or Beth or any member of the mission committee. I just love this um, project 
When I was a little girl, my mother started to expose me to the joy of helping the downtrodden in our little community. And she would stop several times a year at this little house that was so ramshackled, it was really a shack, it wasn't a house. And a little lady lived in there, she looked like a dwarf. And she, was, she had dogs in there with her that were so dirty and flea-bitten that it was unbelievable. Most people in our community made fun of her and nobody was about, uh, about to go there. My mother not only went there, she went inside the door. I don't know if she sat somewhere or not, but anyway, she was determined that this lady was going to know compassion and she was going to know sacrifice and our Lord. So she would take warm clothing, clean blankets, and food, uh, especially at Christmas, but several times during the year she would stop there. So it's in that spirit that I like to remember this time of year, and I wish I could be just a little fly on the wall in some of these residences over at the Family Life Center where these families live just for 30 seconds to see the eyes of some of these people as they open these gifts. I think these six families are especially needy this Christmas, and I say that because of the things they've asked for. Never before have I seen so many requests for shoes and warm clothes for everybody, and really not what I call well, you'll have to forgive me, silly toys. There, uh, there are not very many on the list anyway. And don't worry about me taking so much time because Jim Exline said I could have his, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. So just let us know if we can help in any way. And when you get your gifts done, please bring them to Dana's office so they'll be safe. Or like I say, we'll come and get them. And if all of this could be here by about the 14th of December, which is a Wednesday, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Bonnie, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Jim, we look forward to hearing a word about uh, stewardship this year from the admin committee. Uh, side note, by the way, though I think that shoes and clothing are in fact a, a wonderful, even divine uh, and loving gift, um, there might be room for a silly toy as well, right? Um, Jim? Good morning. Mid-October is, by the church calendar, the, the kickoff for stewardship. Uh, to be able to do that, we needed our budget prepared, and at that time, when we were scheduled to have the kickoff, we were still crunching numbers and trying to make sure that it balanced as close as possible. So today is the rescheduled kickoff for stewardship and although you either received in the mail or picked up from the pews the pledge cards, <clears throat> they will, we have decided to have dedication commitment Sunday on December 18th at which time if you haven't mailed in your pledge card you can bring it down and put it in one of the offertory plates on the communion table. Uh, we have a very healthy budget this year. We we're able to continue our, our programs that come, are supported by the operating fund and some special programs that also are funded by the generosity of the gift from the Telford Foundation. So we uh, do not have copies of the 2023 proposed budget available at this time, but if you would like one, please let Pastor Christian know and you will get one. Jim, thank you very much. And uh, let me, though, uh, though Jim is not uh, uh, probably going to boast of, of their efforts, the uh, uh, let me tell you that it's just really stellar work that the admin committee has done this year because the uh, the budget is, uh, I mean, it, it is the most balanced budget this church has had since I've been here. It's amazing that they've been able to do this, and uh, and they did it well. And it's uh, relatively, uh, the, it was painless uh, with regard to what it's going to uh, 
uh, uh, what pressures it's going to place on the committees to be able to do their particular ministries and missions. Um, it was painstaking watching admin go by every single number and getting it right. So uh, my, my thanks to the admin committee uh, for its hard work. Yes, it's true because of, uh, uh, we're still slow in trying to get ourselves back into the habit of uh, doing committee work uh, since, uh, since COVID. Uh, we are a little late with uh, stewardship, but we ask the congregation to bear with us. And uh, Jim, thank you so much. We will be having uh, uh, our uh, dedication later this month on the 18th. Um, you, you are most welcome. Some have already done so. You can send in your pledge cards all right now if you want, uh, or you can hold them until that time. But uh, either way, you'll be invited to come forward as a sign of our personal lives commitment to the life of the church for next year and for the future. Uh, again, um, my thanks to Jim and to the admin committee for all their hard work. Thank you. Uh, and at this point, my Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. <coughs> Gracious God, it is easy for us in the midst of the trials and tribulations, the turmoils of this life, to lose hope. We know that like the Apostle Paul who looked so favorably toward the return of your Son, Jesus Christ, we too wait with breathless anticipation. <coughs> Where we lose hope, we pray that your Spirit will enliven us again that we can always look forward to your promises, that we may cling to that hope, recognizing that it is the future of your kingdom which defines our actions as your kingdom today. Help us to be a sign of your love to this sinful and broken world. And may we recognize that it is not our righteousness that we lean on, but the righteousness that you've made known through your son, Jesus Christ. It is in his most holy name that we pray, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, uh, we will have an opportunity not only to meditate during the offertory on our self-giving, but to uh, offer of ourselves in our self-giving through the, offer uh, the offerings, uh, your tithes and offerings. It is uh, a time for us to remember that uh, God gave of himself love, compassion, and sacrifice through Jesus Christ, and it is appropriate in worship for us to give of ourselves love, compassion, and sacrifice in the Christ-like manner. Let us do so during the time of the offertory.
your Son, Jesus Christ, who came among us full of grace and truth, making your love known. In his resurrection, it marked a new beginning, a new future, a change in the status quo of our lives. We pray that you will transform us in the resurrection of your Son, that we too can love as faithfully as Christ, that we may put on Christ, that we may give of ourselves as Christ has done. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. charge you, my Christian friends, to go in peace, live as free people, serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Mm -hmm.